I want to tell you about a really amazing experience that keeps happening to me. I give people maths problems, and they cry. <laughs> so you're probably thinking I give them a time test of multiplication facts and tell them it's a measure of their intelligence, which is one of the terrible things that go on in schools all the time, imposed by governments. But actually, it's the opposite of that. And I have given them an open, visual, creative question and combined that with really important brain science on what, what we know about the brain and how it processes mathematics, which I'd like to share with you today. So let me tell you about one of the experiences. It happened in California, near Stanford, where I teach. And I'd been working with a whole room of elementary teachers, many of whom had sat through hundreds of hours of algebra classes, pushing symbols around a page and getting the idea that they really couldn't learn higher-level mathematics. So I wanted to give them a different experience of algebra. And I didn't give them a tables of numbers and symbols. Instead, I gave them this visual pattern. And I asked the room of teachers, can you color the different ways you see this shape growing to show the growth? So quickly, the room became a buzz with different people seeing the shape grow in different ways. Some people saw the growth as a vertical growth. Some people saw it horizontally. Some people saw a diagonal growth. And some people made the pattern into a square to see the growth. Some people made it into a rectangle to see the growth. And there were many different ways people saw the pattern, these and many more. And so two people uh, actually cried on this day. And what happened was, <laughs> I know it sounds terrible, but um, what happened was we were working out how many squares would there be in any sized figure? And one of the, they were both women, actually, who cried. And one of the women uh, realized that when she was looking at the third case, the total number of squares would always be 3 multiplied by 4 and then divided by 2. She'd made it into a rectangle, so she had to take off those purple squares. And she realized that would be true of any case. So in algebra, um, because that's case 3, we can represent that in any case as n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And that actually gives us half n, n plus 1. So why was that moment so emotional for those two people? They'd come up with a quadratic expression. And part of the reason it was so emotional was because they'd sat through many hundreds of hours of maths classes. And they had got the idea that they could never do something as powerful as that. And when you have an experience that helps you realize that you can do something that you'd never thought you could do, that is a powerful emotion, particularly when it's something as important as mathematical thinking. So two things had brought that about, one of which was I'd shared some important brain science with the teachers, and uh, brain science that tells us that nobody is born with a maths brain, and nobody's born without one. Uh, at least the good news, and everybody's brains can grow and change to learn any level of school mathematics. The myth of this math person um, is a very damaging myth that holds kids back on a daily basis. And the second piece of brain science I've shared with them is the very best times for brain growth is when you're struggling and making mistakes. That's when your brain is on fire with brain growth. So when some of the people in the room were working on finding a quadratic expression, it was kind of challenging. But they knew that their struggle meant not that they weren't a maths person. Many kids in classrooms will struggle and think, I'm not a maths person and give up. But instead, they knew that that struggle meant that their brains were growing. And that was really powerful for them. And so why doesn't that happen more often? And why had they not, in all of those algebra classes, been able to come up with quadratic expressions in these ways? And that's partly because maths classes often look like this. <laughs> Individual learners sitting with lots and lots of numbers and symbols, which causes responses like this. <laughs> and what we should have in maths classrooms is situations like this. Oh, this video is meant to play. No. Um, so what we should have in maths classrooms is situations like this, students sitting, working together, um, sharing their ideas, working on visual, creative mathematics. And uh, if we were watching this video, you would see that uh, the students also in here were coming up with a quadratic expression um, the, the, it, that represents the number of colored squares on the cubes that they're looking at. And so when we combine important brain science with open visual mathematics, 
I call that mindset mathematics, and it combines the important work of Carol Dweck on mindset that tells us that when we change our mindset, when we change our beliefs about what we can do, it actually changes our learning with what we know about teaching maths as an open growth subject. So one of the studies that shows most powerfully what happens when we change our beliefs about what we can do uh, came from David Yeager and his colleagues, and they studied uh, hundreds of high school English students. And all of these English students had written an essay. And all of them had received critical diagnostic feedback from their teacher. But half of the students in this study had received an extra sentence at the bottom of the feedback. And what was amazing was the students who received that extra sentence did significantly better a whole year later. So what was that extra sentence, you're probably wondering. At the end of the teacher's feedback, for half of the students, the researchers had put this. I am giving you this feedback because I believe in you. And the kids who saw that at the end of their teacher feedback did significantly better a year later with no other change. It's pretty amazing, and I, when I share it with teachers, I say I'm not suggesting you put on the end of every child's feedback, I'm giving you this feedback because I believe in you. One teacher in a workshop said, we don't put it on a stamp. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> teachers have a great sense of humor. Uh, I said, no, don't, don't put it on a stamp. Um, but we can be saying to our students and our children all the time, I know you can do this. I believe in you. You can learn anything. So the other important piece of brain science I wanted to share with you is this. Um, when we work on a maths problem, even an abstract calculation, five different areas of the brain are involved, five different brain pathways. And two of the brain pathways are visual pathways. And in fact, the dorsal vis visual pathway is the main pathway um, for representing quantity. Our brains want to think visually about maths. And if you've been led to believe you're not a visual learner, you need visual maths more than anyone. The good news is we can make any maths problem a visual maths problem. And uh, we can ask students, find the area of a, rect of a 2 by 12 rectangle. Or instead, we can ask students, can you find rectangles with an area of 24? This is a video that isn't playing. Um, <laughs> any help? No. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> oh, I think we're going to see the video. So we can ask students, uh, can you find an area of a rectangle, a 2 by 12 rectangle? Or instead, we can ask students, can you find any rectangles with an area of 24? That changes everything. Students' eyes light up. They're having to think about relationships, relationships between length and width. Um, they're finding out things. And it, they can come up with many different solutions. So in similarly, instead of asking, can you come up with a quadratic expression, from this table of numbers and, ex and sim symbols, we can ask, how does this pattern grow? We can give many different patterns. People will see the growth in different ways, as we saw earlier, and each of those ways can be expressed algebraically. And it turns out we've come up with a whole range of algebraic expressions, all of them equivalent to half n times n plus 1. It's pretty amazing, really. And instead of asking students to multiply 18 times 5 and do it quickly in a time test, which is damaging, we can ask them, what are the different ways you can see 18 times 5? And different students will come up with different ways of seeing it. We can look at different ways of seeing it together. Um, and we're celebrating the multiple different ways people have ideas. It's really uh, amazing. So I co-lead a center at Stanford. It's called U-Cubed. And we're dedicating to getting lots of free resources out to teachers, parents, students, to show them visual maths, to, to show them how our brain works when we learn mathematics. We were really excited. It, we started it two years ago. And we were re really excited when we got about 5,000 teachers on the site. Now we get 3 million visits a month to the site. And that's because teachers are really excited. They're excited to change from meaningless, boring questions, two trains traveling towards each other on the same track, um, <laughs> to visual, creative maths questions. They're also excited to change from students memorizing procedures all the time, and instead to have students see and use powerful connections. 
They're also ex excited to take away the emphasis on speed and timing in maths and replace it with an emphasis on depth and creativity. And of course, to stop giving the idea that only some students can learn maths and some students can't, and replace that with the idea that everybody's, the knowledge that we have that everybody's brains can grow and change, and mistakes and challenge are the best way to do that. My message for teachers of any content is open up that content and celebrate the many different ways people see and understand ideas. It turns out it's really important to do that, and that's because learning is actually a process of identity. When we learn new things, as Etienne Wenger has said, we don't just learn facts and information. We change who we are as a person. And as we learn new knowledge, new ideas, we change what we believe, we change who we are. And unfortunately, many, most students are sitting in maths classrooms now thinking, I'm not a maths person and I can't learn this. And until we change that belief, we will always have widespread underachievement. It is really important to believe in your own potential. We even know that if you go into a learning um, hard content, a challenging situation, and you think to yourself, I know I can learn this, but then you mess up or you make a mistake, your brain will react more positively than if you go into that situation thinking, I don't think I can do this. It is really important that we have self-belief. Our future selves are within all of us to create. It's really the world that tries to convince us we're not good enough. And the ancient philosopher Lao Tzu said something really important, I think. He said this. He said, when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. So my last message for you is become who you might be. Help others to become who they might be. But remember to always believe in your own unlimited potential because it's only then that you truly set yourself free. Thank you.